This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one website building platform. What I am now going to relate is the history of the next two centuries. I shall describe what will happen, what must necessarily happen, the triumph of nihilism. Hopefully, by now, most people are aware that Nietzsche was not a nihilist. In fact, he was heavily opposed to nihilism, and he saw its advent as a great catastrophe that would befall Europe and indeed the whole world. The misunderstanding probably arose from the fact that Nietzsche wrote a great deal about nihilism, and more specifically about how nihilism seems to find its way into every domain of culture. It does so via something Nietzsche called the ascetic ideal. The ascetic ideal is one of those elusive concepts that escape a quick definition. It's the form of nihilism without a determinate content. The content is determined by its surroundings. Like a chameleon, it takes the color of whatever is around it. What does that mean? Nietzsche explores the ascetic ideal in the third essay of his masterpiece, The Genealogy of Morals. And the entire essay, the whole third part of the book, is dedicated to the singular question, what is the meaning of ascetic ideals? By way of arriving at an answer, Nietzsche explores the myriad ways the ascetic ideal takes shape in different domains of human culture art, religion, philosophy, and science. In this video, we will follow in Nietzsche's footsteps and discuss how the ascetic ideal, in other words, how nihilism, infects everything, from religion to art to science to philosophy. So strap in, pour yourself some coffee, black of course, and join us for a Nietzschean odyssey through European culture, Wagnerian art, Christian religion, Schopenhauerian philosophy, and finally, self-denying modern science. First stop, Wagner. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one website building platform. Whether you're creating a website for personal use or you're managing a brand, Squarespace has you covered. If you want to keep track of books you've read or jot down summaries or notes and keep them organized on a list of what you've read with a summary always handy to refresh your memory, Squarespace is the perfect solution for you. You set up a Squarespace website and within minutes you can find the perfect blog template to do so. You don't need any programming or coding knowledge either as it's easy and intuitive to get started using their Fluid engine. Just drag and drop. They also offer a huge library of extensions so you can customize your website even further down to your precise needs. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash velgeist to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. When Nietzsche traces the ascetic ideal throughout these different domains of art, religion, science, and philosophy, he does so through attacking representatives of that domain. By attacking the part, he attacks the whole. He looks for types, individuals who contain within them the essence of that entire domain. In the domain of philosophy, for example, he takes Schopenhauer as the archetype of the entire field, of its essence and its completion. And when Nietzsche discusses art, specifically, of course, art in the 19th century, he talks about Wagner as the most perfect representative of what art essentially is, what it means, and what it tries to accomplish. It's easy enough to see why. Not only was Nietzsche intimately familiar with Wagner's art, he knew the man personally. They were friends. But above all, Wagner was considered the superstar artist of his time, of unrivaled influence and scope. For better or worse, Wagner's influence on music and stagecraft, and by extension drama in general, is unmistakable and long-lasting. And this influence was already apparent in Wagner's own time. In The Ring des Nibelungen, Nietzsche went so far as to anticipate a revival of German art and the German spirit, awakening the degenerate German culture from their long slumber, an embrace of life and sensuality in the manner of the Greeks, a revival of the great Greek theater festivals of Dionysus. In other words, Wagner's art would spark a revolution. But then, Wagner made his final opera, his swan song, and his crowning artistic achievement, the infamous Parsifal, with a plot that deals with themes opposite of the ring. Gone is the rebellious spirit, the embrace of sensuality, 
the resurgence of virility and a warrior ethos. In Parsifal, the gods are not overthrown as they are in the ring. In Parsifal, God reigns supreme. Parsifal is ruined by sensuality and only attains redemption when he becomes chaste again. Even worse, the entire plot of the opera is set in motion because a formerly chaste king is seduced by an evil seductress, femme fatale. The message in Parsifal is clear. Chastity is good. Chastity has redemptive power. Chastity can save us. We will release a full analysis of Parsifal in due time. For the purposes of this video, however, the important thing to keep in mind is that Wagner seems to celebrate chastity in Parsifal, which is a radical departure from his earlier works. The Ring even celebrates the incestuous relationship between a brother and a sister, scandalizing polite society at the time. And Tristan und Isolde, the opera right before Parsifal, although the work is a complex one, also champions the redemptive power of erotic love. These themes are turned upside down in Parsifal, where everything bad that happens is the result of erotic desire and everything good that happens is the result of chastity. For Nietzsche, this incitement to chastity is an attack on nature, an attack on life itself. It is the ascetic ideal communicated through artistic language, the degeneracy of nihilism put to stage. For Parsifal is a work of perfidy, of vindictiveness, of a secret attempt to poison the presuppositions of life. A bad work. The preaching of chastity remains an incitement to anti-nature. I despise everyone who does not experience Parsifal as an attempted assassination of basic ethics. The plot of Parsifal centers on the magical castle Montsalva, where the Knights of the Grail live in seclusion and protect the Holy Grail, the chalice from which Jesus Christ drank during the Last Supper and which collected his blood after his crucifixion. But the catch is that the castle only shows itself to people with a pure spirit. At the start of the opera, Parsifal, a young boy who grew up in the wild after his mother died an early death, discovers the castle almost by accident. The castle is visible to him because his spirit is pure, because he has never known the touch of a woman. Remember, he's spent his entire life in the forest, divorced from civilization and human contact. But in the second act of the opera, Parsifal is seduced by the evil witch Kundri. Eventually, she kisses him. And with this kiss, suddenly within him, the sexual impulse awakens. In the stage directions, Wagner writes down how Parsifal reacts to the kiss. Parsifal suddenly starts up with a gesture of the utmost terror. His demeanor expresses some fearful change. He presses his hands hard against his heart, as if to master an agonizing pain. And Parsifal exclaims, Here, here, in my heart is the flame, the longing, the terrible longing, which seizes and grips all my senses. O oh, torment of love, how everything trembles, quakes and quivers in sinful desire. Note also the Buddhist and Schopenhauerian use of language. Parsifal's suffering stems from terrible longing and sinful desire. What happens here is that Parsifal becomes privy to the evil of the world, the sexual impulse and the longing desire that underpins it. The second act of the opera ends, and with the third act we open with a time skip. Many years have passed. Off screen, Parsifal had to engage in a Herculean effort of good deeds to purge his soul of the defilement brought upon it by the witch's kiss. The castle is no longer visible to him, he cannot find it anymore, and he needs to embark on a journey of soul purification to cleanse himself and become pure again. All of this is completely counter to Nietzsche, and indeed counter to the early Wagner too, who championed sexuality as liberating not as the source of some kind of defilement. This complete 180 on the part of Wagner, this promotion of chastity and the abundant Christian imagery in Parsifal, was for Nietzsche a sure sign that Wagner, at last, in his old age, fell victim to Schopenhauer and Christianity. But more importantly, he fell victim to the ascetic ideal. He became anti-life, anti-nature. In other words, he became a nihilist. Parsifal, for Nietzsche, was the artistic embodiment of the ascetic ideal, a complete victory of nihilism in the artistic domain. Richard Wagner, ostensibly the most triumphant creature alive, as a matter of fact though, a cranky and desperate decadence, 
suddenly fell helpless and broken on his knees before the Christian cross. Was there no German at that time who had eyes to see and the sympathy in his soul to feel the ghastly nature of the spectacle? Was I the only one who suffered from it? And speaking of the Christian cross, we need to discuss why Nietzsche said that Christianity is a nihilistic religion. Throughout his works, Nietzsche has criticized almost every aspect of the Christian faith. Of course, this critique finds its most powerful expression in one of his final works, The Antichrist. We've done a big video on that work specifically if you're curious to learn more about the nitty-gritty details of Nietzsche's criticisms. For the purposes of this video, where we're talking about the ascetic ideal as a nihilistic psychological phenomenon that seeps into different domains of human culture, we need to take a more general perspective. And for that, we turn to beyond good and evil, and specifically to something Nietzsche called the religious neurosis. There is within man an instinct for the religious, a need for faith, or rather, a yearning for some kind of metaphysics, something beyond himself, a justification for his life. Existence needs an orientation, or as Nietzsche puts the phrase, man needs a goal. For the mature Nietzsche, this goal is the accumulation of power, the venting of one's strength, a discharge of virility. But what happens when one is infected with a religious neurosis? A strange inversion of values occurs. Wherever the religious neurosis has appeared on earth so far, we find it connected with three dangerous prescriptions as to regimen, solitude, fasting, and sexual abstinence. In the history of mankind, this is a relatively new phenomenon. The religions of primitive man, insofar as we can know anything about them, probably did not prescribe fasting and abstinence. In the context of prehistoric tribes, such a prescription would be disastrous for the continued existence of the tribe, where food was scarce already, and discouraging procreation would simply expedite the extinction of the tribe. A very real risk in Paleolithic times, when life was nasty, brutal, and short. We can support our hypothesis by looking at the famous Venus of Willendorf. It's a limestone figure, around 30,000 years old, and thought to represent some kind of fertility deity. Evidently, these humans from 30,000 years ago weren't really all that concerned with chastity. The exaggerated sexual features, on the contrary, show a concern with not enough procreation, let alone too much. An understandable concern for a small-time human tribe just trying to survive in the Paleolithic. The point is, this statue celebrates, or at least doesn't condemn, the human instinct for procreation. And neither did the Romans and the Greeks. The overabundance of phallic symbols and the preoccupation with sex is well attested in both Greek and Roman worlds. No, it seems like the celebration of chastity, as opposed to virility, was introduced in Europe through Christianity. And when Christianity supplanted Greco-Roman paganism, something else disappeared also. Sacrifice. Nietzsche makes an interesting observation about the practice of sacrifice. He calls it the ladder of religious cruelty, in which, broadly speaking, three big movements can be distinguished. First, primitive religion demands human sacrifice. Once upon a time, men sacrificed human beings to their god, and perhaps just those that they loved best. To this category belong the first link sacrifices of all primitive religions. Later on, this practice falls out of favor. Animals are sacrificed instead, or food. But when this practice also disappears, and at first glance sacrifice as such falls out of favor, Nietzsche argues that a sacrifice is still demanded, but a sacrifice of something else entirely, a psychological sacrifice. Then, during the moral epoch of mankind, they sacrificed to their god the strongest instincts they possessed. Their nature, this festal joy, shines in the cruel glances of ascetics and anti-natural fanatics. This sentiment will later become the backbone of Freud's seminal work, Civilization and its Discontents. But it's really Nietzsche who made this point first, right here in Beyond Good and Evil, and he fleshed it out in more detail in the genealogy of morals. The religious neurosis is a sickness in that it demands the stultification of one's own nature, the suppression of human instinct. As Nietzsche will explain later in the genealogy, when the outward expression of one's drives becomes impossible, 
they turn inwards. And this becomes impossible because societies and civilizations grow and they require a sacrifice on behalf of their members. They must suppress their inner violent nature in favor of cooperation to ensure that the whole project of civilization keeps going. But we need an outlet for our instincts. So they turn on themselves. It creates the so-called discontents from Freud's work. Like the mythical Erisikton, a Greek king who was cursed with infinite hunger and ultimately devoured himself, the human thirst for power, violence and cruelty must ultimately find the only outlet still available to it, its own possessor. This self-inflicted suffering is the essence of the religious neurosis. It ultimately culminates in a transvaluation of values, a great turnaround where bad things become good and good things become bad. So the natural inborn instinct for domination through the influence of religion becomes humility. The desire for revenge turns into turn the other cheek. The sex drive, the desire to procreate, turns into a celebration of chastity. The desire to acquire possessions and riches turns into an incitement to poverty. And this, in turn and in due time, turns into a desire for nothingness. Because what else could the next logical step be? Chastity, poverty, meekness, fasting, prayer, these are things that are a move away from the world. They shun the material and disregard the flesh. And beyond that, what else is there? Nietzsche tells us what's next on the religious ladder. We go from sacrificing humans, to sacrificing animals, to sacrificing our own nature. What comes after? Finally, what still remained to be sacrificed? Was it not necessary in the end for men to sacrifice everything comforting, holy, healing, all hope, all faith in hidden harmonies, in future blessedness and justice? Was it not necessary to sacrifice God himself and out of cruelty to themselves to worship stone, stupidity, gravity, fate, nothingness? To sacrifice God for nothingness. This paradoxical mystery of the ultimate cruelty has been reserved for the rising generation. We all know something thereof already. This is of course the infamous death of God and the final stop for any kind of religious feeling. Nihilism. In Nietzsche's analysis of religion, there seems to be something inevitable about its ultimate descent into nihilism. The solution for our current cultural malaise, the answer to nihilism, can therefore not be found in a return to religion. At least for Nietzsche, doing so will at best buy you some time, and at worst it would be an inauthentic play act to try and return to some previous state of being that we, as mankind, have long passed. The religious genie is out of the bottle, so to speak. Because what is at work in religions is the same underlying current that ran through Wagner's art. The ascetic ideal, mankind's desire to will something. And in the absence of something, mankind will turn to nothing. Here is the key to understand Nietzsche's enigmatic final line in the genealogy. Man will sooner will nothing than not will at all. If there is no something to will, if God indeed is dead, we will, at any rate, will something, even if that something, paradoxically, is nothing. That is the core of nihilism, mankind's desire to desire, even in the absence of an object of desire. And if we leave behind the artistic language of Wagner and the religious language of Christianity, we can discover the ascetic ideal, the will to nothingness, in its clearest expression in the lucid language of philosophy we finally arrive at Schopenhauer. When Nietzsche is in attack mode, he spares no kind words for the philosopher he formerly so admired. In Ecce Homo, he says Schopenhauer's philosophy has the stench of a rotten corpse. We've discussed Nietzsche's relationship with Schopenhauer in more detail in its own dedicated video. As far as the ascetic ideal and nihilism are concerned, Nietzsche finds them most clearly expressed in the philosophy of Schopenhauer, which he designated as the newest philosophy. Schopenhauer is for Nietzsche the last significant philosophy, before his own, of course. Therefore, in attacking Schopenhauer, he attacks philosophy as a whole and formally breaks with it by being opposed to it. It's no coincidence that Schopenhauer, in his treatment of ethics, 
arrives at much the same conclusions as Christianity and other ascetic religions such as Buddhism. In fact, he was proud of it. To him, it was the ultimate proof that his philosophy talked about something profound within man, that he put into philosophical language what other peoples and cultures had merely put into religious language. When Schopenhauer paints the virtues of chastity, self-denial, fasting and poverty with golden colors, as Nietzsche so nicely puts it, he arrived at an intellectual underpinning of these virtues through the power of reason and contemplation, whereas the old religions of Christianity and Buddhism only arrived at these things by revelation or through mystical experience. So Schopenhauer, in his own mind, was the first who pulled these ethical precepts out of the dark, cloudy language of myth and religion and brought them into the light of rationality and reason. He thereby found himself in agreement with the oldest consciousness of humanity, and he considered it a point of strength for his philosophy that he penetrated the depths of the human soul and got rid of the surrounding allegorization and mythology, and that he painted a clear, lucid picture of it. Of course, from Nietzsche's perspective, all Schopenhauer did was regurgitate the ascetic ideal and put it into yet another language. He revealed the creeping nihilism that was silently preparing itself through the philosophical centuries. Beginning with Plato, it seemed to Nietzsche that philosophy was on track to get rid of the material world in favor of some immaterial beyond world, a Hinterwelt, to use the original German term, a world divorced altogether from our reality of day to day, a hidden world, but a more important world nonetheless. For Plato, the world of ideas is the real subject of philosophical inquiry. The task of the philosopher is to contemplate the ideas. The material world is only an imperfect reflection of those ideas. This philosophy morphed into Christianity, which also shunned the material world. Heaven, or the kingdom of God, in this system takes the place of the world of ideas in Plato's system. And as the power of reason plows through and marches on, it arrived at last at Kant, who posited yet another Hinterwald, the thing in itself, this weird, strange, unknowable world beyond, that provides the metaphysical underpinning of our reality, but which, nevertheless, by virtue of our human reason, is objectively and forever out of reach for our human understanding. Schopenhauer identified this thing in itself as the will, the ever-striving, blind, irrational foundation of the world, and he saw it as the highest ethical precept to remove oneself from this world as much as possible so as to calm down the will and ultimately deny it. This denial of the will takes the form of self-mortification, fasting, chastity and poverty. So this centuries-long march of philosophy, beginning with Plato, going through Christianity, finding Kant and culminating in Schopenhauer, starts exactly where it began with a hatred of the material. But this hatred of the material for Nietzsche is nothing else than the ascetic ideal, latent nihilism gradually taking a more definite shape. It has always been there, it has always exerted its influence, it will always devour whatever it finds. And we have stopped believing in these hinterwelds, these beyond worlds. God is dead. All that is left is this world of appearance, the material world that philosophy has always regarded with suspicion. Philosophy shouldn't concern itself with the material. It should concern itself with the world of ideas. It should concern itself with metaphysics, not with physics. Physics, that's science. But there is no metaphysics anymore. Only the physical now remains. Will nihilism ultimately destroy this final refuge as well? We are now ready to tackle the final frontier of this creeping, devouring, hungry nihilism modern science. As for these celebrated victories of science, there is no doubt that they are victories. But victories over what? Up until now we have seen the ascetic ideal at work in what we would call the humanities today. At last, Nietzsche turns his mind to the world of science. To be sure, this distinction between the humanities and the sciences is a recent modern development. In the past, and certainly in the German-speaking world, such a difference is not as clear-cut as it is today. Still, to modern sensibilities, there is a great divide between the humanities and the sciences, so much so that, nowadays, there is barely any overlap between them, 
and both academic disciplines seem to live in their own bubbles, doing their own thing far away from each other. There might even be some hostility between the two spheres. So while we have seen the ascetic ideal at work in religion, art and philosophy, seeing the same principle at work in the cold, calculating, seemingly objective world of the hard sciences might require some more effort. Luckily, Nietzsche is here to guide us. A valuation of the ascetic ideal inevitably entails a valuation of science as well. Lose no time in seeing this clearly and be sharp to catch it. The main point Nietzsche will make is, of course, that in modern science the ascetic ideal is at work also. But to unmask it is not so simple as to compare Schopenhauer's philosophy with Christian ethics, for example. What does the scientist believe in? Fundamentally, a scientist is after truth. In that respect, he is no different than a philosopher, or even no different from a theologian. Their aims are the same, even if their chosen method and the conclusions that they reach are not. But it's precisely this belief in truth, in the value of truth, that becomes a problem now. It has become a problem because God is dead, and truth died with him. Let's be more specific. Ever since the time of Plato, there has been an unspoken assumption in philosophy. In the Platonic worldview, all good things emanate from the form or the idea of the good. Therefore, such concepts as justice, equality, beauty, etc. must emanate from the good. It's Plato's answer to the question of why we should care about these things. Why bother with justice? Why bother with beauty? Answer? Because these things are good. And the good justifies itself. It needs no further explanation. You can see how, especially in Nietzsche's reading of history, this idea of the good with capital G as the origin and foundation of all things good, lowercase g, ultimately morphs into God. In the Christian worldview, justice, beauty, equality, etc. likewise emanate from God. They exist by virtue of God. By the way, this is how to understand Nietzsche's famous quote that Christianity is Platonism for the people. The Christian conception of God is, in Nietzsche's view, a watered-down version, a more easily digestible concept of the Platonic form of the good. But here is the catch. Truth is also one of those attributes that emanate directly from the good or from God. This is the platonic union of things. Justice, beauty and truth are all branches from the same tree, so to speak. The good. Or, to put it in Christian terms, God. This belief has become so ingrained in Western culture that we barely notice it's there. And, to be sure, Nietzsche will gleefully point out that the so-called atheistic scientists of his day have not gone far enough in their repudiation of God that they still unknowingly hold on to metaphysical beliefs, despite the fact that the foundation of these metaphysics has collapsed. The tree is cut down and the branches are lying on the floor. Again, God is dead. Therefore, all these things that depend upon God, such as justice and beauty, but most importantly, truth with a capital T, lose their foundation. They lose their value because their value was derived from God. It depended upon him and now he's gone because we've killed him. They all fail to realize the extent of the need of a justification on the part of the will for truth. Here is a gap in every philosophy. What is it caused by? Because up to the present, the ascetic ideal dominated all philosophy, because truth was fixed as being, as God, as the supreme court of appeal, because truth was not allowed to be a problem. Do you understand this aloud? From the minute that the belief in the God of the ascetic ideal is repudiated, there exists a new problem, the problem of the value of truth. The will for truth needed a critique. Let us define by these words our own task. The value of truth is tentatively to be called in question. But we must take a moment to pause here. This calling into question of the value of truth, strictly speaking, is about Nietzsche's project for the future. What we are discussing in this video is the past, or rather, the past up until Nietzsche's present time. Nietzsche's big point is that the scientists of his day, and let's be honest, the scientists of our day as well, don't see this problem yet. They still believe in truth. 
They still believe that objective, capital T, truth, is out there somewhere, that modern science can uncover it, and what's more, that there is value in discovering this truth. But to talk about values, this is metaphysical, philosophical talk. Haven't scientists progressed past the need for philosophy and metaphysics? They might say they do, but, says Nietzsche, in all actuality, they don't. They go about their investigations as if there is a platonic form of the truth out there and that they will uncover it. Of course, they might say that they don't believe in Plato or in the Christian God or any metaphysics at all. They might even be hardcore materialists. Yet their belief in truth subsists. But what is truth in a godless materialist universe? What is the value of truth if the world is nothing but atoms simply doing their thing? Well, says Nietzsche, scientists have not gone far enough. They might have shaken off their belief in God, but God is only the outer layer, the external shell of something more fundamental, something they think they are rid of, but which actually still subsists, only more sneakily, more hidden, more elusive. The ascetic ideal. The scientific revolutions of Copernicus and Darwin provide Nietzsche with the ammo for his attack. To be clear, Nietzsche is not saying that their discoveries are untrue. Rather, he is saying that their worth, their value, we could also say their meaning, are not in opposition to the ascetic ideal. In fact, he calls them the strongest allies to the ascetic ideal because they provide a veneer of objectivity, of indisputableness which is also how we need to interpret the following sentence. As for these celebrated victories of science, there is no doubt that they are victories. But victories over what? Nietzsche's answer to that rhetorical question is of course that these scientific victories are not victories over the ascetic ideal. As much as Copernicus and Darwin have made atheists out of modern man, it does not follow from that loss of belief in God that we are also rid of the ascetic ideal. Remember that Nietzsche says Christianity is nihilism. But that does not mean that someone who is not a Christian is therefore not a nihilist. As much as modern scientific man turns against God, saying we don't need religion to understand our place in the universe or to explain the origin of mankind, it does not follow from this repudiation of God that he therefore got rid of the underlying instinct that made God possible in the first place. And that underlying instinct is the ascetic ideal, it's nihilism, it's a desire of mankind to belittle mankind, it's the instinct of life turned against life itself. Darwin showed that mankind is not a divine being created in God's image, we are not a holy creature, not shepherds of the earth, we are evolved primates who happen to be a bit smarter than other primates. On a more fundamental level, we are just genes trying to procreate for no real reason other than, apparently, that's what genes like to do. Copernicus proved that the Earth revolves around the Sun, that we are not the literal center of the universe, and he started a revolution in astronomy that has kept the same pattern ever since. Time and again, we discover that the universe is much larger than previously expected. There is not just one solar system, there are billions of solar systems in our Milky Way, and not even our Milky Way is unique. No, there are billions just like it in clusters and superclusters. We discovered that stars are born and die, and that our sun will die too and swallow Earth in its explosion, and that there is such a thing as entropy, which will ultimately result in the complete heat death of the universe, and nothing will ever exist again. How far we have fallen from the medieval worldview, where man was the literal center of the universe, where man was divinely crafted by God in his image. And Nietzsche called this nihilistic. How much worse is it now? Has there not been since the time of Copernicus an unbroken progress in the self-belittling of man and his will for belittling himself? Alas, his belief in his dignity, his uniqueness, his irreplaceableness in the scheme of existence is gone. He has become animal, literal, unqualified and unmitigated animal. He, who in his earlier belief was almost God. Since Copernicus, man seems to have fallen on to a steep plane. He rolls faster and faster away from the center. Whither? Into nothingness? Into the thrilling sensation of his own nothingness? Well, this would be the straight way to the old ideal. But here's the thing. This constant belittling of mankind is a source of pleasure. 
It's the pleasure of inflicting pain. At any rate, it's the pleasure of feeling something. The thrilling sensation of his own nothingness. All science nowadays sets out to talk man out of his present opinion of himself, as though that opinion had been nothing but a bizarre piece of conceit. You might go so far as to say that science finds its peculiar pride, its peculiar bitter form of stoical ataraxia in preserving man's contempt of himself. This is the essence of the ascetic ideal stripped of all its pretensions and window dressing, its pure nihilism without the ornaments of religion, the intoxication of art or the consolation of philosophy, but with the objective veneer of respectable science. Nihilism is the act of willing nothing, because mankind will desire something, and in the absence of something, man will sooner will nothing than not will at all. That's again a paraphrase of the enigmatic final sentence of the genealogy, and it answers the question that we have left unanswered so far in this video. Where does the ascetic ideal come from? It comes from mankind's inability to find meaning for his suffering here on earth. And the ascetic ideal gave it a meaning. It gave mankind something to will, something to strive towards, something to do. It gave man an orientation for his existence, a reason to live. Man, the bravest animal and the one most inured to suffering, does not repudiate suffering in itself. He wills it, he even seeks it out, provided he is shown a meaning for it, a purpose of suffering. Not suffering, but the senselessness of suffering was the curse which till then lay spread over humanity, and the ascetic ideal gave it a meaning. It was up till then the only meaning, but any meaning is better than no meaning. The ascetic ideal gave mankind a direction, the wrong direction to be sure, but any direction is better than having no direction at all, than being a leaf in the wind, unsure of where to go or what to do. Better to set yourself upon a random path and see what you find, than remain in place until you die. And so Nietzsche arrives at the end of his genealogy of morals, which is, as we have seen, the history of nihilism, the road that the ascetic ideal has taken and the paths it has brought us on, its long march through history, philosophy, art and science. Finally, Nietzsche exposes it as a will to nothingness, which itself is simply a will to will, a desire to find meaning, even if that meaning is quite literally a self-destructive nothing. It is absolutely impossible to disguise what in point of fact is made clear by every complete will that has taken its direction from the ascetic ideal. This hate of the human, and even more of the animal, and more still of the material, this horror of the senses, of reason itself, this fear of happiness and beauty, this desire to get right away from all illusion, change, growth, death, wishing and even desiring, all this means let us have the courage to grasp it, a will for nothingness, a will opposed to life, a repudiation of the most fundamental conditions of life. But it is and remains a will. And to say at the end that which I said at the beginning, man will wish nothingness rather than not wish at all. So ends the genealogy of morals, Nietzsche's diagnosis of Western culture, his unmasking of the European disease, the march of nihilism. And like any genealogy, it looks at the past, our ancestors, those who came before, and it ends with the present generation, with the here and with the now. So much for the past, but what of the future? Nietzsche speaks about the ascetic ideal as a direction, a road that was chosen in the past. The ascetic ideal is an attempt to answer the question of the meaning of life, or more pressingly, the meaning of suffering. But as we have seen, it's only one answer. Sure, it was the only one available to us, but beggars can be choosers, and any meaning is better than no meaning. But is there another answer? Something, perhaps, we should strive for going forward, if we decide to take another direction, walk another path. In other words, what about the future? Of course, dear viewer, that future is Zarathustra. Stay tuned, and thank you for watching. These long videos would be impossible without the support of our Patreons. If you enjoy the work that we do here, take a look at our Patreon page and consider supporting us. You'll also get access to a dozen exclusive videos that deal with topics that might be too spicy for YouTube. And yes, I know lots of you are waiting for a dedicated analysis video of Das Spoke Zarathustra. 
Trust me, it's coming. I just want to do it justice and make it my best work. If you don't want to miss when it comes out, consider subscribing to the channel. And of course, liking this video and leaving a comment also helps out a great deal. Again, thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.